Hello everyone, welcome. My name is James Harding, I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. Um, uh, and when we set up Tortoise, one of the reasons for it was that there's a certain privilege, a treat, if you like, of being a journalist, which is people come in, leaders in the arts or cultural politics, into a newsroom, and they have what's new, known as an editorial board meeting, a meeting in the newsroom that only the journalists get to be a part of. And I always thought it was, in some ways, the most interesting part of the news, where you talk not just about the headlines, but try to understand what's behind them, and everyone in the room gets to weigh in. In all honesty, when it really works, it's a conversation between the person who comes in with a point of view and one that's tested and examined and, and discussed by everyone in the room. So we set up at Tortoise the idea of a thinking, which is in effect an editorial meeting, but it's one that's open. It's open to all of our members. And we hope that this evening, whether you're joining us online or here in the room, you'll really feel yourself part of the Tortoise newsroom and you'll weigh in because it's hard to think of someone who's more in the intersection of what's happening in politics and public life uh, than Lucy Powell. Now, I should just tell you one thing, which is I normally get, go at this stage with a really, really excessive, baroque, purple introduction of our guest. And I was all ready to do that with Lucy when we were sitting downstairs in the green room and she said, I don't think I've spoken to you since that time you shafted me in 2015. And so I thought it would probably be better that rather than me give some big, you know, bloviated account, Lucy, yeah, should we go that. over that conversation? I was running BBC News at the time and Lucy was running Ed Miliband's election campaign. So in front of everyone, this is the time for me <laughs> to make amends. What did I do? Yeah, well, you deserve to be allowed to make amends. <laughs> no, so I was running Ed Miller, well, not Ed Miller, but I was running the Labour Party general election campaign. You remember 2015, all became, the narrative came very much set around the kind of polling and would there be a coalition and blah, 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 squeezed out the Lib Dems, it sort of squeezed out Labour, you know, that was kind of... And we, it'd been quite a difficult election. <laughs> You, I think you got a phone call from Tom Baldwin pretty much every day berating you for what was on the 6 and the 10. That was obviously everybody's obsession. And just before the election, I was sort of sent in to do a round of interviews. I was doing five live, and the main banana skin was, would I get my words wrong, or would I, would I kind of make a, a, a faux pas on Labour and the SNP, and would we do a deal? I swerved all of that, and then I was so got, sort of went so relaxed. I was then asked about the Edstone. Do you remember the Edstone? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Look at it, fond memories for everyone. <laughs> and, and I sort of. So the question was: so because it's now in stone, does that mean you, you'll 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 stick to the promises? And I just got my words slightly wrong. Something along the lines of: well, just because it's in, written in stone doesn't mean to say that we're definitely going to sort of stick to the promises. Well, I was kind of... What I meant to say was, of course we'll stick to our promises. It's not because it's... All... Anyway, the Tories put out a press release about that. It was like a silly slip of the tongue. Nick Robinson and your good self decided that this um, story then warranted the top of the six and the ten just a few days before one of the most important elections uh, we faced in, in many times, at which point I was absolutely sort of crushed that I had caused such a thing. And I had a big argument with Nick Robinson on the phone, who was determined he was going to run the story. So then I went to you um, to say, this is a ridiculous story to run so close to an election. It was just a bit of a slip of the tongue. You're, you're running with the toys. Anyway, it didn't. And anyway, I was left. I remember where I was when I took that phone call. We were just where, talking where, about. Where were you? I was actually in my bedroom in Manchester because my kids had just gotten from school, and I was, I, I was crying. It was the first time I re really cried in that election at all because it was just, it, it, you know, you're just so helpless. And that was probably the last time we spoke, James. So <laughs> now is your moment <laughs> to really sort of say to me, "I'm sorry about that." <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I forgive you. They say the week I is a long time you. in politics. Look, unless you're yeah, for the yeah, coming yeah. hour. Yeah, no. um, I forgive you. But, but can I ask... It hardened me up. It hardened me up. Uh, yeah, it seems... Well, it's obviously derailed your career. You remember the Shadow Cabinet and the Different. Shadow Culture Secretary. But, but can, I, can I ask you just to... Our aim this evening is that we're going to talk, given Lucy's job now, to try and understand what is the future of the BBC. That's, if you like, the billing. It feels odd to talk about that without thinking about Channel 4 and the broader culture se sector. But we're also at a moment where everything feels so precarious politically that I know people will want to talk about the state of the government and, for that matter, the state of the opposition. So 
please do catch my eye if you're on screen. Just, you know, uh, either raise your hand or, or, or make a point in the chat. We'll make sure we bring as many people in as possible. But, but can, can we start there, Lucy? Because the suspicion, I think, of politicians when it comes to the media and vice versa is that it's almost impossible for politicians to be good judges of how to create a strong and independent media, particularly a news media, because you're in play. You're, you're, if you like, setting the terms of the playing field, but you every day find yourself commented upon, possibly criticised. So how do you think about that? You know, you're shadow culture secretary, but within a couple of years you could be, you could have, have oversight of the BBC, Channel 4, the media sector. How do you make sure that you're a dispassionate judge of what's best? No, I think that you're, that's the pertinent question, isn't it, really? I mean, I think, for, from my point, and I've thought about this quite a bit, that it's not my job as the Shadow Culture Secretary or hopefully one day the Culture Secretary to really take an editorial view of the BBC or, or any other broadcaster's uh, output or, in fact, any newspaper output, as, as in this job. If it was something personal about me, then obviously I'll have a, I'll have a view about it. That's for whoever's responsible for that policy area or the director of comms of the Labour Party or, or whatever to, to pick up the phone and have an argument with you or your equivalent these days um, on, those, on those issues. I think it should be uh, my job or the job of uh, Nadine Doris uh, in that job at the moment to, to take a, a view about the governance, the structure, the what's in the best interest of a vibrant broadcasting... Uh, and creative industries ecosystem uh, in in this country, which is phenomenal. I think it's you know it really is one of the sort of jewels in the crown of Britain, really, isn't it? Um, and how do we foster that and support that? And that's that's one of my main criticisms with what they've been doing with the BBC is that the the statement that we had in the Parliament on the BBC and the, its future funding and the future of the licence fee was completely linked to the editorial judgment question and, and impartiality and all of those sorts of things, which I, I, don't, I think they are separate issues. That's not... I get asked all the time by Labour colleagues, oh, will you take up this with the BBC or well, the way they've interviewed this person or the way they've reported that? And I'm like, no, that's not my job. Get on to the director of comms. I'm here to, 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 to look at that in a different way. So but, but Lucy, do you not think everybody that, does that, obviously. But, but, but do you think, do you think mean, the Tories have a point? Do you think the BBC is left-wing? Um, no, I think, I mean, I find Nick Robinson as annoying as Nadine, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and he interjects me all the time um, when I go on. So, um, no, I, 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 I don't think so. I think, the, I think the BBC probably, like most media organisations, needs to, 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 to constantly look at itself to make sure that it does represent the whole country, all parts of the country. Uh, all demographics and, and, and that kind of thing, um, which obviously the BBC Channel 4 have been trying to do by moving more of their journalists, more of their commissioning, more of their production outside of London and, um, and whatever else. Because, but no, I don't think the, I don't think the BBC's um, I don't think the BBC's left wing. I think they're tough on everybody. Can we, can we, just because we, we haven't had this conversation and we, no one ever gets to have it and never gets to have them in the heat of an election um, itself, let's, let's go back to that moment. It must have been a few days before the general election mm -hmm. of 2015. So there's a version of I'm sorry, which is you cried in your bedroom. <laughs> it was just <laughs> overwhelming. There's another question, which is, is that the wrong editorial judgment? On the day, a few days ahead of a general election, is it the wrong editorial judgment when someone senior in a campaign is making it unclear whether or not promises will be kept? Or is it, and I put to you, there's a second question, is it the wrong editorial judgment because the way in which we cover the news in the run-up to elections is now so much about what someone said, a slip of the tongue, a moment, you know, a mistake, a kind of... a failure of the choreographed drama. And that's the moment we sort of see a glimpse of the truth and we seize upon that. Is, is, your, is your version of what was wrong that night on the 6 and 10, other than it being you, <laughs> was, was it that 
we were into kind of small failures or that actually overall the way in which we covered politics was wrong? Probably a bit of both. I mean, yeah, I do think, and, and I think there was some reflection after the 2015 election, I think, by broadcasters, by, by the media to some degree, because the, the polls through that election dictated the narrative, which was a narrative the Conservatives wanted, and then the polls proved to be very inaccurate. And so I think there was quite a bit of deep thinking after that. I don't know, you could probably tell me if there, there was, but I remember that at the time. And I think, I certainly remembered then in the 2017 election, I thought the, the, the BBC in particular and other broadcasters tried to keep a, a, a bigger point of view on the election rather than that. But I do, I do think we have a tendency, our politics in this country, maybe it's because there are so many political journalists who are all employed to sort of cover the same things. Everyone's looking for the tiny little nuance, the tiny slip up or the mistake or the thing, the little bit of an exclusive, rather than the big questions of the day, which is what the electorate really care about. I mean, you know, I, I spend most of my weekends campaigning. That's what I, I always do. I go mainly go to sort of nearby constituencies and areas that are what you might call red wall, marginal sort of seats. And everyone's like, oh, is it terrible for Boris? It's like, no, people are still asking about parking bins and dog poo, yeah. like, or, you know, crime in their area or the fact they can't pay their energy bills. Because we tend to have a sort of Westminster obsession with those little things. So I think that's what I... I was, obviously, I was upset because I was in... You know, I, I, yeah. I buggered it up and then yeah. I was the news and, yeah. you know, it was my job to make sure everybody was on message and then there I was sort of... But it was such a tiny slip of the tongue that you, if you'd listened to the whole interview, you totally understood the meaning of what I meant, that was that really the most important thing that the British public wanted to hear about a few days before a big, important election? Well, let's come back to it, because I'd really like to come... <laughs> I, I would genuinely like to come back to it, because the funny thing is we used to have... I mean, you're right, there was a whole review of the impact of polling and the way in which it had affected thinking about stories and priorities. But there was also a lot of trying to navigate just the sort of noise in our ears from, as you say, Tom and the yeah. Tories as well. And we used to have a meeting kind of basically at dawn every day. And then we used to have a final meeting at the end of the day after we'd had that kind of ear bashing at sort of 11 o'clock at night, trying to navigate which of those two arguments was right. So I think it would be useful to come back to, as we think about the next general election, journalistically, but most importantly politically. But, but let's try, Lucy, because I'm not doing a very good job of it, let's try and, and tackle the BBC question. And, and if I might, I'm going to start with everyone in the room with a, with a question, which is, if you... I used to work at the BBC, and one of the things that I was unkindly asked when I started there was... If these budget cuts continue, always a great sentence, if these budget cuts continue and everything gets closed down, what's the last thing that we keep? And so I just wanted to know, I'm going to kind of give you a kind of selection, strictly the Today programme, Radio 3, Country File, BBC Stoke, or something else that I've not thought of? In our time. In our time. There we go. OK. Um, CBeebies. Yeah, CBeebies. No, bite size. Bite, bite size. size. Yeah. All right, I just wanted to have a check. Who here thinks Strictly? Well, I love Strictly. <laughs> of course. Um, I mean, that's right about the well, could I live without it? Oh, I don't know. But no. Uh, Today programme? The last thing. The Today programme? It's exactly, it's a newsroom, you can really say that. The, um, what else, the country file I came up with? Of course, the beating heart of the BBC. Radio 3, the website. Did I say the website? No, you said, be, you said Radio Stoke, which is what I'm going to vote for. A Radio Stoke? Yeah, I'm going to vote for that. Yes, and CBBS, which was a great suggestion. OK, CBBS is like right. <laughs> OK, Lucy, or hang on a second. Or bite size. Susie, Susie Kershaw said woman's hour with, like, 27 um, uh, exclamation marks. OK, um, Lucy, I've, what would yours I've be? I've gone off. I've gone off at um, woman's hour. But, um, yeah, no, I think, I think local radio and, and kind of the local democracy piece, 
that BBC now does. In fact, I was in Stoke this morning, I was in um, Newcastle under line, and I was interviewed by a young journalist who's part of the BBC programme the for the, program. the local democracy programme. Yeah. yeah, so there's now 165 of them. Yeah. So he works for the Sentinel, um, Stoke Sentinel, oh, yes. uh, and wouldn't be employed otherwise. But obviously he shares his content with Radio Stoke and, and the local uh, BBC outlet. And he was covering me doing kind of election campaigning stuff in Newcastle. And, you know, and, that, and that is the sort of stuff that I think... Without without the BBC these days, would you have? It's the last newsroom standing in many communities, isn't it? So if you so if you take that idea, mm -hmm. it's 2022, a century since John Reith established the BBC. What remains of that idea? What would you now invest in, and what would you say, in effect, the market, private broadcasters or private media can do? I mean, I think, I think the value of the BBC is that it is all of those things. I think if you, if the BBC became BBC Four and Radio Four, I mean, well, maybe maybe Tortoise subscribers <laughs> might so. might also subscribe to that, but it would be quite niche, wouldn't it? And that's the sort of non-commercial stuff. So I think, I think if the BBC doesn't have Strictly and MasterChef and you know the sort of mainstream stuff that I enjoy watching um, as well then then you lose the universality of it don't you You lose that sort of buy-in and then that makes it harder to maintain the local news or CBBS or bite size or the world service and all the sort of non-commercial aspects of it so I, I think that's a sort of the essence of what is the value of, of the BBC is that you've got that universal reach and universal is payment. It just, is, it just, is there anyone here who thinks the BBC should move to a subscription model, i.e. that it doesn't necessarily need to keep universality, it can still service the public well? You don't need to... Nico, do you want to just explain? Well, it's, it's oh, we'll just problem. introduce yourself as well. All right, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Nico MacDonald, um, sometime media lecturer. Um, it's not so much that it should move to subscription, but there was a very interesting discussion with um, Piers Morgan on the media programme on Radio 4, yeah. Um, with Ros Atkins and you know Piers Morgan naturally were saying you know this should, you know my children subscribe to all the media that they consume why should they not they're not going to tolerate paying the license fee why should they not be subscribing to the BBC and Piers Morgan claims to be and probably is a big fan of the BBC so it's not so much that it's just I think you know I'm going to raise the issue of the, the culture war Britain is a very different place from what it was 30, 40 years ago when I started listening to the BBC radio, not least, and it's an incredibly divided place. And whatever role the media's played in that, it cannot sit on the fence, and it does not sit on the fence. And to expect the British people to pay a licence fee to support that, when at least half the country is not represented over major issues, you know, Brexit's obviously the major issue, uh, it wasn't represented over by the BBC, it uh, just seems to me to be taking the piss apart from anything. I'm not sure whether subscription... I think the BBC should move to a curation mode. I think it should curate the best media and content in the world. I think that is a real role it could play. Whether people will pay for it and how you pay for it is another question. But I, I think in the era of culture wars, I don't think we can be expected to pay for an organisation that doesn't represent half of the people in the country. Lucy? Well, I mean, I think... I think well, I was saying at the beginning, I mean, I think the BBC and many other media organisations need to make sure they do sort of represent the whole the whole country. I, I don't think... I think it's a misreading of basically northern working-class voters, because that's sort of what people think of, that don't value the BBC, because they do. Um, they, they perhaps don't want to pay £13.50 or whatever it is a month and, and, you know, that everybody pays the same and there's a cost of living crisis going on. Um, you know, so I think there are, there are issues there. And I agree with you. I mean, my children don't switch on terrestrial television. They don't even use that remote. They use the, they use the smart TV remote and that, they, they do access a lot of BBC content. Um, and they do use BBC Bite Size and lots of other things. So, yeah, I think the BBC has to constantly evolve and uh, and innovate in order to continue to be relevant to the audience it's there uh, to serve. 
Um, but I don't think that's a, a sort of question of a, an existential sort of question at the moment about whether it should exist or not. But, but, but can I ask you, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's one version, if you like, of the criticism of the BBC, which is the country's divided, it's unfair to expect the whole country to pay for the BBC. There's another version, which is what you'd hear more, you heard it from Oliver Dowden, you hear it a bit from Nadine Doris, you certainly heard it from Downing Street, which is that the problem with the BBC is that in principle it's a good thing, but in practice it's biased. It's got a problem with impartiality. Do you think that's true? I don't, I don't know that you can... I mean, I think that's just stoking a kind of view, view that's out there. I, I, I would almost say that perhaps the BBC's gone too far the other way in, in kind of service of, of some of those concerns recently, that it's become sort of too impartial in a sense, because I think what people want these days are opinions mm -hmm. and, and discussion. Um, now, you've got to represent all opinion. Yes, that should be part of what you do for, for impartiality. But I don't think that means... I think if you look at some of the big presenters and some of the big figures that are sort of leaving the BBC mm. to kind of find their own voice and express their <coughs> own voice, people, people want opinion. And I don't think we should mistake opinion for impartiality. As long as those opinions are representative of, of all opinion and we're not sort of snobby about opinion and... Um, and we don't sort of dismiss opinion as, as it's never going to happen anyway or it's not, it's not worthy of, of, of discussion. Uh, you've got to represent all of those opinions. So, I don't know. I, I, th th there's, I, can, I guess there's, there's, there's another thing which you, you hear as well, which is actually in the absence of a kind of mission, in the old sort of, like long before my time there, the sort of Mark Thompson, you know, mission to explain uh, idea, and this is around the, the mm -hmm. journalism more than around the entertainment side of the BBC or the education side of the BBC, is that what's happening is that the Conservative government is, if you like, setting the terms of the problem. And I wonder, if you were Culture Secretary, Lucy, what you would do if, if you had the room to say, look, here's the problem we want the BBC to fix, or here's the problem within the BBC that needs fixing, what you would deem that to be? Well, I do think it should continue to, to push out and be less London mm -hmm. sort of centric and less kind of media bubble centric um, in terms of that, the sort of the, the demographic. I think obviously I'm a Manchester MP and you know, you were, you were around with a big move up to Salford. To yeah. Salford. And, I, and I think that's really changed the output of, yeah. of, of the BBC, especially Breakfast and Five Live and the things that, that come from there um, and some of the commissioning. And it's been a massive boon to the creative industries economy uh, in Manchester. I think they could go further, go beyond that um, and, and continue to, to, uh, to, to push to that. But, yeah, I mean... Also, you've got to get out of the way a little bit because I do, I do think I do agree with you that that the the sort of charter settlement just comes around so quickly, doesn't it? And so then you're kind of you're, you're dancing to the the government's the government of the day's tune all the time, maybe editorially and, and those kind of things, and overcompensating a bit. Um, so I'd, I'd encourage encourage the BBC uh, not to do that. But but we I, I think we have we have a world renowned creative industries, uh, creative economy, creative industries sort of ecosystem in this country, as, as I say, and the commercial sector is just as important to that as, as, as the BBC Channel 4, yeah. you're supporting the indies and, you know, going after a different kind of audience, a different model. Every, most other countries are trying to recreate that in some way, um, which they, they are struggling to do. Um, and, and we sort of break that up at our, at, at our peril, um, really. But, but just to touch on that, on the independence and the freedom of people to, to uh, express themselves in the BBC. You mentioned, Lucy, the cost of living crisis and the kind of job that you'd have as Culture Secretary with the Treasury and Number 10 to figure out what the right level mm -hmm. is for the licence fee. What do you think it is, less or more than it is today? Well, look, I didn't, I didn't oppose the two-year freeze particularly because I think in the context, I think a Labour government would have done, would have done the same in that sense. Um, and then it's inflation thereafter mm -hmm. for four years. I think probably in the grand scheme of things, that's not a bad settlement for the BBC, although it is real, real terms uh, kind of uh, cut there. 
But as, as we get to the sort of charter renewal period, as there is every time we get towards that, you know, there is, there is a moment to have a bigger conversation about um, is a flat fee the right, is that, is that the right way of doing it? You know, I think at its essence, it has to be something that is universal. It is based on a, on a, li on a universal uh, licence fee. And it, and it does retain, in its essence, the things that a commercial BBC wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do. And they are far reaching, as you just... Just, 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 just in mm -hmm. case I'm about to commit another act of journalism. Yes, yes. Um, you said earlier, you know, there are some people who can't quite work out why everyone has to pay the same. And then you said, you know, there is a wider debate about whether it should be a flat fee. Do you think that there should be, yes, a universal licence fee, but that it should be progressive, i.e. that people should pay different rates? I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm not here to write the future Labour manifesto or to preempt a sort of future BBC sort of charter. But I think periodically you've got to revisit and have those debates again. I mean, often and every other time we've we've had we you know the past Labour governments, James Pennell, who um, you you'll know, you know, yeah. uh, you know, we, the, these conversations come around, and we and we usually land back at the sort of model we've got now because all the other options have kind of got well, have got worse it? aspects. So I, I I don't think that's something you should you should you should preempt. But I'm, what I'm saying is. Is it something you always should rule out and say, no, it's absolutely the, the, the only way to do it is the model we've got now? You but should sure, constantly sorry, just look at that. Just because it's important what mm -hmm. you're saying, which is mostly when we get into a debate about funding the BBC, it's people who either say, let's go for a subscription model or for a German household mm -hmm. tax model. You don't actually hear people say, well, we've got progressive council taxes, we've got progressive income taxes, why don't we have a progressive licence fee? Mm -hmm. Do you think there is a logic at least to explore that? There is a logic to explore that. I think there is a logic to explore that. But whether... That's where you end up. Whether that's where you, you end up and, and it's not... And again, I don't think it's the right thing to sort of... A politician on their own sort of decides something like that and comes on a, a show like this mm. and says, says it sort of long before. I think, you know, th these things have to be part of a very extensive... Um, kind of process. And, and, you know, one of the criticisms I've got with the Dean Doris was she... She put in a tweet on a Sunday night, this will be the last licence fee yeah. as we know it, um, at their ergo ending the licence fee completely, then came to Parliament the next day and said, oh, no, no, you've, you've sort of misunderstood me. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about a conversation. OK, a conversation about what? And mm. what are the terms of that conversation? Mm. And how mm. are we going to have that conversation? Who's going to chair it? What's the group? What's the process? How long will it last? Oh, well, you don't need to know any of that. Um, well, it could be any one of many things, but none of which I've ever thought about. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to go down, down, that, that down that path. But as I say, I think often in the past, you, we end up coming back round to, well, we probably wouldn't invent the licence fee today, but is there a better way of doing it? N no. There usually no. isn't by the time we've sort of looked uh, at can it. Can I ask one other question? I'm going to come to you, Sarah, and you, and then so, so, some views in the room. But just one final thing about this funding question. Mm -hmm. So you say, you know, it's probably not for a politician, and I, I think you're saying it's probably not for a politician to come here and just sort of make policy on the hoof, tempting as that is for all of us in the room. But there is a separate question, which is, is it right for a politician to set the budget of what is, as well as being a huge entertainment corporation and a force for education, the most influential newsroom in the country. Is it right that, in effect, the Culture Secretary, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister, all of whom are having their homework marked by the BBC, ultimately set the budget for the BBC? I think there's probably a, a question about whether the, um, the time frame for that could be longer each time so that there's there's more distance between some of those um, conversations. Uh, well, somebody's got to set it, haven't they? Yeah, but lots of other things. I mean, when it comes to civil service pay or the independence of the Bank of England, the government has actually said, look, we'll have greater trust in our institutions yeah, that's... If, there's, if there's a distance between us and the decision-making on Poss those kinds of budgets. Poss possibly, yeah, possibly. Possibly. OK, we'll come back. <laughs> so, will you introduce yourself? Yes, yeah. hello, I'm Thomas Mason. I should probably declare an interest. I work for the BBC and I've worked in a mix of those last things you'd keep. The radio bulletins are, are uh, on, on Radio 4. Currently, 
sending out actually political material to the likes of Radio Stoke through the, through the regions team. But, but it, it strikes me that the BBC is working quite hard to attract some users who might, may never pay. So I work briefly in the digital video team, and, and that's a bit of the website you don't have to pay for. There's no iPlayer login or anything. So that, that, that it, it, there's a real risk, I think, if you go down a subscription model um, that you know these, these, these people you're attracting are, are not going to sign up. So, so I, I prefer that, that, that household council tax model I think that's the simplest the, the German style I'm not sure if I had a big house I'd, re I'd want to pay 500 a thousand pounds for the BBC so I think there would probably be a, okay, a, a limit, limit how far you, you go but I think I think if you if you have a subscription model you, you're just going to cut out the underserved audiences which there are efforts uh, some of them better made more successful than others to, to actually attract those audiences Lucy, do you mind if I take a few points? No, so no, you can, so, so we can give me a break in. for a minute. I want to. I, I want to ask. I don't know whether you know Peter York, but <laughs> yes. the only reason I'm saying is that Peter's also written a book about what is the war against the BBC. Uh, I co-wrote with Prof. Patrick Barwise of London Business <laughs> School a book called "The War Against the BBC." In it, we explain why subscription is both a bad idea and a silly one. <laughs> it's a bad idea because it denies utterly, and anyone who's ever run any kind of business which is based on subscriptions will understand this, which makes you think that the academics and think tank people who argue for it haven't ever run a business. <laughs> but fundamentally, you cannot have a universal business a universal organisation based on subscriptions. Mm -hmm. it, you can't do it like that. In a subscription-based business, you focus on the most valuable, commercially yielding groups of people. It's also very expensive as a part of your total expenditure to run a subscription-based business, much more expensive than running a license fee-based business. So it's a bad idea because it denies universality. And I don't imagine you would want to deny universality, for instance, in the NHS. But, but Peter, can I, can I ask you one question? I'm not arguing. No, 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 no. 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 And then it's a very... About, we've been through the actual economics of subscription and they make no sense at all, and the technology of subscription, and it's not doable for about 30 years. No, and, and by the way, and, and I think that if you get to John Whittingdale, he probably ends up saying the same thing, the former... You in know, private. Broadcasting, in private, he does, yeah. But Peter, can I just put something else to you, given that you've written a book about the war against the BBC, which is partly about commercial arguments around the BBC, but partly around cultural ones. It's primarily about cultural ones. W one, of the, one of the questions I've got for you is whether or not you felt, or you found in your writing and reporting for it, that people in the BBC felt they were sufficiently defended by Labour. So if there's an encroachment no. on the NHS... Is right. the short answer no? <laughs> Lucy, what do you make of that? Because people would say that. People would say, historically, Labour could be counted upon to defend the BBC, but for the reasons perhaps that Nico mentioned around, you know, culture and politics, there's a, there's a nervousness about coming to the aid of the BBC in a way there, there, there definitely isn't around coming to the aid of the NHS. Well, they probably didn't hear me, me responding to Nadine in Parliament a few weeks ago um, on this very issue. And I was pretty robust about that. And actually, maybe maybe to your point, I mean, I did get a lot of people get in touch with me about that to say well, it was nice to see that yeah. for, for, for the first time in a while. So I don't want to sort of comment on some of my predecessors. But um, look, I think there's, there's no question that the BBC is, would be significantly sort of better off in terms of being enshrined and have its future sort of more secure under a Labour government. Because we support the licence fee and we support public service broadcasting. Mm. And that's a, like a non-negotiable. And we support universality. Um, so they're, they're all kind of non-negotiables. Um, yeah, but may, maybe a lot of my colleagues, understandably, get also get miffed with, the, with some of the output. Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> but okay. as I say, that, that it's a hard job to try and separate those things. And you do have to do that. Mm. You do have to do that. And maybe structurally, as you say, there are some of the things that will help, help the BBC into the future to have a bit a greater degree of separation in that. Can we, I just want to ask my colleague Phoebe, who's got... Thanks. Um, I just want to make a plea to the BBC World Service. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I did mention that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But just in the context of it, it's, it's, it's good to think of it UK-wise, but obviously you look at Russia and Ukraine that had an mm -hmm. impact beyond 
the UK. I think that's important. Um, and I, I know Giles will agree with me. Um, and then my other point, I think you were kind of mentioning Andrew Marr very subtly. And I mean, you can't avoid the buses in London now. And the fact that he's got his voice back, I don't I think we should really acknowledge that that's what they've run the global campaign. So another big people from the BBC who've gone that way, that seems significant and, and who's kind of stepping up to those plates. Um, and then finally, the consultation on Channel 4. Scrutiny on that, because from Channel 4's response, you know, you said, like, we're talking about the licence fee, we go through these processes in Parliament. How are those processes working? Is there proper scrutiny on those processes? Who are the people they're bringing in? You know, 60,000 responses is a lot. Where's the joining dots? Because it just doesn't seem to add up. And I wonder like, what your thoughts are on that as well. Sorry, question. I know I'm not asked you questions. <laughs> Do you, want to do, do you want to do Channel 4 sure. first? Mm. And, then we, but I, and I would love to hear what you think about Andrew Marr, Emily Maitlis, John Sopel. Um, well, again, I mean, I was very robust in my response about Channel 4, and I will continue to be. We're, we're, we're expecting a, a further statement in Parliament on that um, this week, but you just never know with this government. They announced stuff in the media. They did Channel 4 over recess when there wasn't the sort of parliamentary scrutiny. But I, I, don't, I don't see the case for privatising uh, Channel 4, and I certainly don't agree with the, the government's case for privatisation of, of, of Channel 4. Um, you know, there might be an argument, as we were discussing about, about the BBC, in terms of the future of, the, of, of Channel 4. Can it sort of survive in 20 years, 30 years, as a, as a player, as a relatively sort of small player in a, in a, in a bigger um, pond? But that's not the motivation, let's be honest. This is another kind of... Uh, distraction from Partygate, maybe, part of the sort of generating a culture war. But they've got problems on their own backbenches with that because it is a Thatcherite model. It, you know, the, the remit that it was set up to, to deliver, it sets up, it's, it's delivering that um, very well, supporting the small indies, the pipeline of talent. Um, it's now trying to play its part in the sort of levelling up agenda and moving outside of... Um, of London too, it doesn't cost the taxpayer a, a penny. In fact, it's you know it's been um, sort of making money um, much much better in recent years, which it reinvests uh, in, into into programming. And it, that that kind of Thatcherite idea of disrupting the ecosystem a bit, so that there was somewhere that new small indies could come in and make programs, and then own the IP, and then uh, grow into sort of bigger companies. Channel 4, you know, it, it, it is really tick, 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 really, in terms of, of, of delivering on, on, on the remit. So and the idea that it needs to be privatised in order to sort of compete with Netflix and Amazon and so on, when it's most likely to be bought by one of those companies is, I, I, you know, it's for the birds, really, as well. So, so look, we'll, we'll robustly challenge that in Parliament. And, and as I say, they've got an 80-seat majority at the moment, although it doesn't often feel like that in recent weeks. Um, there's a lot of disquiet on their own benches about that. It wasn't in their manifesto, so it will make it harder for it to get through the House of Lords as well. Um, but, yeah, we are expecting a media white paper in the next few days with legislation coming on that later in the year, but it will it will probably take quite a while to get through Parliament. Lucy, just before, before we get to the politics, and I, and I realise that a number of people have got their hands up on screen, so I'm going to try okay. and get to them too, but just give us your version of what would be the right thing to say to people in front of the BBC microphone, presenters like Andrew Marr or Emily Maitlis or John Sopel, what do you think the rules should be in terms of what they can say on air? Because you're saying it would be great if, they, if we heard more opinions, as long as there's a full range of opinions. What's your guidance, then, to presenters? Well, that's not really my job, no, is you're it? you're inviting people to have an opinion on air. Well, How I, would that I work? Think, I think it's for the editorial output as a whole to sort of balance those opinions across a, a range of things and not just get drawn into, like, what... Nagam and Chetty said on Breakfast one morning or what Emily Maitley said on Newsnight one evening, as long as you've got other programmes or other output and other opinions that are offered elsewhere, I think. I think. I mean, in part, if you look at, I don't know, talking of global, you know, with LBC, they've got a range of presenters, don't they, with a range of different 
of different views. You sort of know who the Labour ones are. You kind of mm. know who the, the more let's, right-wing let's, let's ones are. But that across their whole output, I don't okay, know. OK, but let's take, let's take a practical example. Could the BBC hire Piers Morgan? I don't see why not. And what then would Piers Morgan be allowed or not allowed to say on air? Well... I mean, you'd have to have. Can't believe I'm giving Piers Morgan more airtime. Yeah. Well, no. I mean, you'd have, you'd have, obviously, you'd have to have sort of certain parameters around that. You, you're a public service broadcaster, and you know, he, he wasn't even able to stay on ITV, was he? Um, and who, who also a public service broadcaster. So that there are certain kind of rules of the game. But yeah, I don't. I, you know, I don't think we should be sort of snobby about that. There are a lot of people who agree with Piers Morgan's opinions on things. True. Aren't there? Um, so, but as long as you've got people who've got a different opinion, who've got mm. the, the opposite opinion as well, yeah. yeah, then you kind of meet that whole... I don't know, maybe not go that far, but I think you don't want to just go vanilla down the middle, do you, all the time? Um, uh, and, don't and you think? You, you're, you do, used to be the head of news. Yes, I had to... I mean, in front of my colleague Tess, Murray makes this point, which is, I think, like, absolutely the right one, which is you'd much rather hear presenters voicing views and those views being views competing than having vox pops that you think somehow kind of paint a picture of public opinion actually the vox pops often don't do that so yeah i do i do see that i think it's i think it's more difficult than it looks because Definitely. because the problem is you could have a range of opinions across the overall output but that's not necessarily what a viewer listener or license fee payer would see or hear. So I think mm -hmm. I understand. I do understand the problem. Just one thing before we mm -hmm. leave media altogether: if the Tories government does get the uh, Channel Four privatisation through, would a Labour government bring it back into public ownership? We're a long way off that. We're, 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 you're, you're assuming, you know, lots of lots of things, but we'll, we'll, we'll see where like... we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I'm not. You know, okay, I'm not making sort right. of manifest commitments now. I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something but... sorry, that's slightly annoying to some yeah. of the people just waiting to make a uh, comment. I'm aware that we've got about a quarter of an hour, and I want to okay. make sure we get some proper politics done here. OK. So, so As opposed to... <laughs> as opposed to what we've done so far, <laughs> which is just sort, nice of, sort of, you okay. know, media <laughs> chit-chat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, 2015, you ran the Labour election campaign. Mm -hmm. You must have learnt a lot. And so if you are sitting now advising Keir Starmer's team on what needs to happen between now and polling day, what is it? Yeah, well, you do learn a lot. And actually, in, in, in politics, you, you, know, you, learn, you learn a lot more through mistakes, don't you, than getting things right, really. And politics, I don't know if it's like this in the media, but in politics, you kind of, once you've, you've kind of been on a losing team like that then you, you you're not kind of credited sometimes with having kind of more experience than than maybe um others but yeah look it's a tough it's a tough fight for for labor we 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 had our worst election defeat ever in 2019 pretty much um it's almost the same in terms of seat numbers as 1983 you know, to win an overall majority at the next election will take a bigger swing than has ever been achieved ever and winning more seats back than have ever, has ever happened in a single election. But it is a volatile... Uh, it is a volatile electorate. I mean, I would, I would say um, that, you know, we need to build that broadest possible voter coalition and understand it's a, it's a different voter coalition to previous elections. So it's not like 1997. It's not like other elections. When you look at the electoral map from 1983 to 2019, the same time we held the same number of seats, there are about 80 seats that are completely different that we hold today that we didn't hold then and vice versa. So in 1983, most of Scotland, most of the north of England, we didn't have really any seats sort of south of Watford Gap. Now we, we hardly had any London seats in 1983, you know, and now we're, we're very strong in London. We've lost a lot of seats in the north of England um, and the Midlands, and we've lost nearly every seat in, in Scotland. So it's, it's a different voter coalition that we need to rebuild. Um, and, and I think what unites that voter coalition, your kind of metropolitan London sort of, uh, maybe remain media types a little bit more um, with your what you what these days get shorthanded as sort of red wall 
you know, white working class, former Labour voters who voted Conservative uh, in the last uh, few elections, particularly in 2019, who voted to leave, uh, leave the EU. What unites them, I think, is that, is that they want a more um, big change on terms of the economy and how it works for, for everybody. We have an economy in this country that doesn't, doesn't work for everybody. Um, and I think we can go further and more bold on some of those bigger ideas uh, around how we create a, a, an economy that is a fairer economy that works for everybody can and you addresses their living standards. So, sorry, I'm, I'm looking up if yeah. people want to weigh on this, but Lisa, can you just explain that? So th that, that voter coalition you described, metropolitan London remain and then the white working class disaffected in Mm -hmm. Brexit 2019, that doesn't sound that different from 1997. So what is different? No, I think it is, I think it is quite different. In, in, in 1997, it was all sort of Mondeo man, do you not remember? It was yeah. like the sort of middle class. We needed to win over the kind of middle class, didn't we? So who is it now? And so now it's much more, your, uh, we, we need to win back the former Labour voters, but not lose too many off the other end, essentially. Who, the, the core Labour voter these days are more based in cities, uh, you know, more graduates, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a divide on geography, on education, and, and the Labour current, currently who voted for us in 2019 and who is the sort of core Labour vote is not what the core Labour vote was in 1997 at all. So where we need to reach into is, is quite different now. And, and then could you explain... To and people... so they're more left, you know, wet the, be left wing economically, but but you know divided on some of those bigger sort of cultural or societal issues. And do you do you have sort of Labour friends who say to you, Lucy, I don't understand. You've got Boris Johnson, who in his own way seems to be kind of tearing down the reputation of Conservative Prime Minister. You know, if you take that view for you know integrity and competence, you've got a cost of living crisis. You know that is really hurting people and you have a sense of deep anxiety post-pandemic in public services, how is it possible the Labour Party is not looking like they're going to kind of storm into Downing Street? How come it doesn't feel like it's 96, 97 again? Because I think we still got quite a residual brand problem in, in, in many ways. Um, you know, lots of the sort of voters and seats that we that we lost. It's a bit like when you kind of give up smoking. You know, people who voted Labour all their lives and sort of felt that Labour hasn't delivered for them or that they're, they voted Labour all their life and things are still sort of shit round here. You know what I mean? So I'm going to vote for someone else. And once you kind of make that move, it's, you know, it's a bit like giving up smoking. It's, you become a kind of almost a sort of zealot for your new kind of reformed, non-smoking ways, don't you? Um, Can I just say, fortunately, this is not on Five Live a few days before a general election, <laughs> but I would advise you not to go with that metaphor on the basis that your argument is, take up smoking. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's, it's brilliant. No, no. You're going to love it. <laughs> I, did, I did a worse thing on telly the other day when we were talking about, um, you know, the, the EU bringing in, um, kind of showing you when you go over the speed limit. Yeah. <laughs> I said on TV, live on television, well, my car does that already. It goes off all the time. It's really annoying. <laughs> and I, Joe Coburn was like, I think what you're saying there is just... I was like, no, no, I think they get the speed limit wrong. It gets the speed limit wrong. Um, yeah, so... But your point is that it, yeah. it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the it, hazing principle, isn't it? It's that once you've made that sort of big change, you've gone through that, mm -hmm. You, you you need to be right. You can't go back to a position that partly, was kind of familiar. Yeah. Or... And partly, and I think, you know, on the Brexit question, you know, I think they felt Labour was in the wrong place um, on, on them, on things like the big the big issues they cared about. Yeah. We, we wanted to have a, you know, a second referendum. We were saying, oh, you, you know, yeah. you, made, you made the wrong decision. I think can, you just, can, can you just do it again? Can I, can I ask you a question? Because my colleague Laura Spirit, who's mm -hmm. here, was pointed us to kind of the, points to David Canzini inside mm -hmm. Downing Street. And, you know, I'm not in the weeds of this, but she says, if you really want to understand, well, you're going to say it better than I can, but, but that he's a, you know, you don't, but he's a, but what's interesting about him is a, you know, someone straight out of CCHQ come into the heart of the Downing Street operation and seems to be focused on the road to the election campaign and centrally Brexit, delivery of Brexit. Do you, do you hear, Lucy, whether or not it's in your constituency in Manchester or elsewhere, do you hear people saying, look, I just want to see Brexit delivered 
is, 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 is Canzini right that that is going to be a fault line in the election? I, no, I don't hear it so much at the moment, no. Um, because I think maybe people, people feel that has been do you, well, done I now. The question is, kind of, has the pandemic, war in Ukraine, cost of living crisis, do you think that means we're into a kind of a period of post-Brexit politics? I think so. I think so. Um, but I think, you know, we, we've got to sort of show that we've listened to, to, to voters, we understood that they they want change and voting for brexit was was about wanting some uh, change in their lives and in their local communities and we didn't respect their vote on that um we didn't and so you know but yes i do think that we possibly are in a sort of i don't know i don't know what does he think i i think i think we i think we are but you know it's for labor now i think what's happened over the last Sort of few months, you know, there's a hu huge implosion in the in the trust in the fortunes of, of Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, who would have thought that two years ago, somebody who just won an 80 seat majority in a, in a general election um, would implode so massively, so quickly? And now the sort of Tory party doesn't know where to go next and what type of Tory party they want to be. Do they want to be a sort of low tax, small state or? Are they a big levelling up interventionist sort of Tory party? There's no idea where they want to go with that, and that's going to be a problem for them. So we've been handed an opportunity that we might not have otherwise had, and and but we doesn't mean to say that we're sort of carry it as as it Harold Wilson said it. I think carrying the Ming Ming vase across the ice rink. You know, we we've, we've got to give people a reason to vote for us, and I think all of us in the shadow cabinet and Kia especially recognise that that the next year. 18 months or so is about Labour giving giving people a reason, an active, proactive reason mm. to vote Labour and you're setting out the agenda and taking control of that agenda ourselves and not just being um, on in the sort of fortunate position of, of, of being against a government that's totally imploded. Mm -hmm. Because that in itself, I don't think, will be enough. Lucy, before we finish, one of, the, one of the great things about living a life both in the newsroom and on Zoom is that you can see what people are talking about once you've left, in that there's a kind of raging conversation still going oh, on right. about the oh, BBC. Oh, right. Sorry. Not least, you know, who likes Women's Hour and who could live without you and yours. But I, I just want to make sure that we pick up two voices before we're quite done, and my colleague Giles will tell before it's, it's, it's all over. Um, Mark has had his digital hand up for a fair old while. I don't know whether or not, George, we can just hear from uh, Mark. Hello there. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. OK, great. Um, I co-founded a community radio station um, and we were never able, and this is 20 years ago, we were never able to get a FM licence because we were told by Ofcom that the BBC were, ho were hogging all the frequency in, in the area, which is Merseyside. Now, I agree with you that on uh, local... Um, BBC Radio, which incidentally the BBC defunded about five to seven years ago. That should be the thing that the BBC is doing. The BBC should be doing local and every, both TV and, um, and radio. And um, that we should be toning down BBC One and letting that out to the market, also BB, also Radio 1 and Radio 2. Hmm. And thank you, Lisa. Just before you answer, I just want to make sure we hear from uh, Federico, because he's also had his hand up for a while, and I'll ask you to mm -hmm. respond to both. Sure. Federico, are you there? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I just have one big question, which I asked repeatedly on the chat, but it's like Lucy and, and also to hear from the Labour Party's vision is what is the vision for public service media in this country? Because a lot of the topic we discussed around the license fee and around all these other, um, you know, different aspects of the BBC, I think they kind of, I need to understand, is there a vision for public service media and what is it? Because this can't, this government doesn't seem to have one. Lucy, do you want to do first? Do you want to do Mark's point about support of local radio, and then Federico on yeah, the vision? Yeah, sure. No, I mean both really good questions, um, tough questions, uh, but the right ones. Well, look, I mean, obviously there is. There's been a long argument about BBC crowding out. Mm. 
um, other actors, whether it's commercial radio or community radio. I think that's um, that is an issue that that needs airing. I think probably with the onset of uh, DAB and you know YouTube and so on and all of that, the kind of FM question probably isn't isn't quite. Uh, the question that it was, but the commercial radio sector do lobby, and rightly so, I think, to say the BBC has to sort of stick within its niche and its lane, uh, you know, a, a, a bit more in terms of the percentage of of talk radio over over music and so on. But just on your point about Radio One and, and um, some of the other sort of radio stations, Radio Six in particular. You know, the BBC does a, a, a great service to kind of new music, which the commercial, you know, when you listen to commercial radio, I listen to commercial radio all the time, but it, it, and, and their model is 80% of the music is the same songs, you know, depending on what you want to, if you want to listen to Smooth or I listen to XFM or whatever, it's like, it's very of the genre of that radio. That's what I know I'm getting when I turn on that radio. And these days, when you've got streaming and you've got Spotify and you've got kind of um, commercial radio, the kind of discoverability issue is is the key issue for a new art for a, a new artist coming on the scene. How do they get discovered when you can listen to any music that's ever been made ever in history, whenever you want it, on, on Spotify? And actually, the BBC does a really good job of discovering new music and giving it airtime. You know, Radio 6, which I think has like 2 million listeners nowadays, it doesn't get any advertising or anything, and it's, it's a lot of new music. So I just want to make that plug. It's, I know people often simplify it as you can just get rid of Radio 1 and Radio 6, it'd be fine. Um, but I think it would do a lot of damage. The bigger point, look, the vision, I mean, it, it's how we can grow and encourage and um, and still be that world leader in public service broadcasting that is continues to be the envy of the world, but that is accessible to everyone in every part of the country, not just to, as, a, as a consumer, but as a career choice, as a somebody who could go and work in uh, in in public service broadcasting or, or, or broadcasting more more generally. Um, you know, could a could a 16, 18 year old or a 21 year old from Rochdale in Greater Manchester or Rotherham in Yorkshire, could, could they, could they get, have a career in, in the creative industries in broadcasting in, in this country? Is that still too hard for them to access? I would say that it is uh, still far too hard for them to, to, to access. So I think the role of government is to say, we've got this, Envy of the world, a jewel in the in the crown. I think of um, uh, of of a, a, an ecosystem that's incredibly diverse. It's the envy of the world. It's one of our great exporters. It's what we're known for around the country. But it won't be a mantle that will always hold. We've got to continue to push the boundaries, innovate. You know, <laughs> look at ourselves, make sure we can do that. But but have that talent pipeline and and be reflective of the country that we're. Mm that we are seeking to, to speak for, which we don't always do. I just want to make sure I, I know... It might not be the vision that you... It might no, not no, be the no, detailed I, vision that you want, but... George, did you want to, you want to have, I, make one a point? A brief suggestion, not so much about Labour and broadcasting, but about Labour. Yes, uh -huh. far away. Um, Lucy, you, you, you say that the party has a, a brand problem. I just suggest today, on the day after Macron's victory, that the party has a leadership problem. I mean, you went from Corbyn, who didn't represent the country, to uh, Keir Starmer, who doesn't inspire the country. If you could find someone who did both and had an ounce of charisma, then I suggest anything would be possible, inc including relitigating Brexit. <laughs> um, well, I'd have to disagree with you about, um, you about that. Very, very much so. It, it, it's, a, it's a really, it's a horrible and hard job being leader of the opposition. To be honest, it's very, it's very thankless, and um, and nothing prepares you for it other than than doing it. And so people do get better at it and grow into it as they as they do in um, in in many of these sort of uh, political jobs. But and and I think. Relitigating Brexit is is a generational issue. I'm, I, you know, I'm afraid. I mean, look. I lost a lot of friends during that home parliament 
phase because although my constituency voted Remain, I represent a kind of, you know, broadly sort of city uh, seat. And my seat is probably a bit like the voter coalition that Labour needs to, to build in that I've got a lot of kind of traditional um, white working class communities in my seat in the city centre and the diversity of, of, of a city like Manchester, which is, you know, a, I'm very, very fortunate to, to represent I think the best constituency in the, in the country, obviously, in my home, uh, my home city. But I, I felt very strongly that we shouldn't go down the road of a of a second referendum. I knew that would be a disaster for us in in uh, uh, in many parts of the country, and that I'm a, I'm a Democrat when it comes to it. I, obviously, I campaigned for us to remain. Um, I used to run Britain in Europe, you know, which is a precursor to the sort of Yes campaign uh, in a previous in a previous life. But when you when you kind of lose a vote, you can't just say, well, the electorate got it wrong, whether it's a general election or whether it's a referendum or whatever it is. You can't just say, well, we're going to carry on. It's a bit like the challenge that Labour faces now. You can't just say, well, look, we're going to carry on exactly the same because the electorate just got it wrong. You've got to say, no, the, the electorate got it right because they're the electorate. We got it wrong and we've got to ad adapt and, and change and, and respond to that. And people voted to leave the European Union. It's an argument we, we lost at that point in time. And I think it's a generational, um, that is a, a generational settlement, really, um, unfortunately, but it is. Lucy, thank you. I, I should say one of the pleasures of the, leaving the BBC is that when you run six minutes over, the world doesn't yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should just tell you, if you run 30 to 40 seconds over on the six or ten, there's someone from the BBC One who calls you and goes, what have you done to the schedule? Like, Half a minute? We're seven minutes over now. Well, it's like being on the Today programme. You go on it and they ask you the first question. They say, oh, thank you, sorry, we're running out of time now. <laughs> <laughs> not even, I've not even started answering the first question. Well, I don't know whether so. it's a measurement of my lousy timekeeping or how fascinating it is listening to you, but thank you. I, I should say... That if, if, if I were the BBC and I was sitting there listening, I'd think to myself, firstly, we've got someone who really does champion the fundamental principles, universality, public service, uh, broadcasting and the licence fee, but also has an idea, because I know that you're saying it's a long way from here to the manifesto, but this idea of a progressive licence fee does, I think, change the terms of the debate, because... That, that's, that's never been really progressed, and so I think it would be a really interesting thing. Uh, I suspect that many people would be interested to see how you would put on air your idea of a competition of ideas and opinions. Um, an idea I think people would love, a question of how, you do, how do you do it, uh, and many people here, um, whether it's uh, uh, Mark or me or others, uh, uh, share that question about how do you deliver on local. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming here this evening. Uh, thank you everyone for joining online. But uh, whether you're online or in the room, uh, please give a warm round of applause and a big thank you to Lucy. Thank you. Thank you.